One of the best things about my job is that I get to speak to smart, forward-thinking people to get their insights and their perspectives and to possibly get a glimpse of how the demolition industry of the future might look. One of the best conversations I've taken part in recently was the one you're about to hear. I caught up with Adam Cornell of a company called Unbuilders in Canada. And although I wanted to look specifically at the unique approach that Adam is taking to the demolition process, the conversation took in such diverse subjects as the Indigenous Peoples of Canada and Adam's appearance on the Canadian version of the Dragon's Den TV show. So sit back and enjoy this conversation with Adam Cornell. This is Unbuilders. I, uh, I mean, I got started really young um, with with my dad. So I was, uh, I mean, I was, I was a weird kid. I was drawing blueprints by five years old and then sort of renovating with my dad, mostly on our own home as, as a child and, and then flipped the house with him when I was in high school. Uh, and that really got me hooked. I always knew I wanted to be in construction in some capacity. Um, I thought it was an architect and, and later that became a builder. Um, and so then I went to university, studied uh, philosophy and anthropology, which has nothing to do with construction. Um, and, uh, and but that really like set set the tone for my environmental roots. I wanted to be in construction. I wanted to do something sustainable, make sure that um, I was having a positive impact on uh, society and, and the environment. And so after university, I, I started working for uh, a custom builder and uh, moved to Vancouver, B.C., uh, in 2013 to launch a, a green construction company, um, which I did and operated for about six years. And we were always sort of deconstructing on our own projects. Um, I had a reclaim wood shop, so I was making furniture and products for our clients and really knew the value of the lumber that we were recovering. Um, and it's sort of just step by step. There was policy that was put in place in Vancouver to mandate green demolition. Uh, which meant you had to recycle. You couldn't just dispose of um, the vast quantity of material. And that really piqued my interest, realizing the writing was on the wall that deconstruction, at least in Canada and the US, was going to become the industry standard over the next decade. And we had the opportunity to get a jump start on it, build a really great brand. But also for me, it's really about the lumber. I wanted to have a supply chain of the lumber and create new products for the building world, sustainable products so that we could be a supplier instead of just a builder and have a much larger impact. And so many projects uh, deconstructing under a contracting company eventually led to Unbuilders splitting off as, on its own. And that quickly led to me completely shifting from building to unbuilding, um, which is now uh, where, where I sit, that we're just deconstructing. And we have a secondary company called Heritage Lumber that sells reclaim wood and uh is beginning to manufacture our own products your website pro, uh, proclaims the fact that you are proudly unbuilt in british columbia for, for somebody that, that I, unfortunately up to this day i've never actually visited canada what is what is what is your area what is british columbia yeah so it's the westernmost province of canada uh we're just just north of washington state in the u.s and uh it's uh, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful province, mountainous, oceans, forests, um, some of the last intact old growth forests um, really in the world. And it's just covered in pr primarily coniferous trees and, and always has been. So we had historically huge old growth trees here. Uh, a lot of them were actually shipped back to England in the 1800s when the logging really started and uh, the early, early years of, of Canada's um, inception and uh yeah it's just a beautiful natural area of the world that uh i'm here basically because of how beautiful it is and and how you know clean the air and the water is and i'm sure that's influenced your your approach to sustainability now i, I mentioned earlier the fact that you're in the demolition business but that's only partly true because as your company name suggests you are taking somewhat of a unique approach to the process what is unbuilding yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, the, the company name is very strategic to, to really dif differentiate ourselves, not only from demolition, but also from deconstruction, even though we are a deconstruction company. Um, and that's because the term deconstruction in this area has been greenwashed, which I'll talk about. But 
unbuilding is really deconstruction to its purest form. It's it's separating a material, a building layer by layer, um, separating those materials on site to then maximize the salvage, maximize the recycling, and minimize the waste. So it's it's approaching demolition from a different perspective. It's really a paradigm shift. We're not. Uh, I, I think demolition is trying to get in and remove a building as fast and cheap, fast and cheap as possible. We're trying to remove a building uh, to salvage and recycle as much as we can while doing it as fast and cheap as possible, knowing that, you know, budget and timelines are extremely important to our builders, developers and homeowners. Um, so really deconstruction is the removal of a building and in doing so, maximizing the amount of materials you can salvage for reuse. If you can't salvage them, maximizing the recycling and then minimizing the waste in the end. Now, we've mentioned previously the fact that you are um, you, you've also got your your finger in the uh, pie of uh, lumber. Yeah, is the, the the process of unbuilding primarily to get your hands on on lumber, or are you you know recycling, reusing, and salvaging literally right across the board? No, we are salvaging right across the board. So for us, our interest is the lumber, but uh, that that's sort of the uh, the bonus at the end. We, we are salvaging everything else. We've got a really great partnership with our local Habitat for Humanity, which is a charity in North America, um, and we donate just about everything else to them. So that includes, uh, you know, your appliances, your your cabinetry, your fixtures. That that all we we salvage all of that as well. And we donate to them and then the, the building owner actually gets a tax receipt for that donation um, so we get that tax receipt or we get the materials appraised and so there's a financial incentive as well for salvaging uh, in terms of a tax receipt which can be quite lucrative um, because the appraisals get quite high in some of these buildings or homes so take me through the difference between recycling reuse and salvage where do you draw the line between all of those yeah, and that, that's great because I think that's the, the, the big point that, that we're trying to, to make is that um, deconstruction in its purest form is really the exact same as unbuilding. Um, but uh, here, because there's a green demolition bylaw, you have a lot of demolition contractors claiming they're deconstructing when really what they're doing is, is what's called green demo. So it's, it's demolition, it's some site separation of materials, and then you recycle the materials. Now, recycling is better than the landfill, um, but we can certainly do better as a society. And, and recycling is really taking a material and it gets downgraded to a new stream. So plastics is the easiest one to think about. You take a hard plastic, it gets downgraded and turns into something like maybe a single-use plastic bag. Um, whereas salvaging for reuse is actually upcycling. So it's taking a product adding value to it. And now it's actually a more expensive, better product. So with us, it's, it's the lumber. We take a, we can take a, a piece of framing lumber out of a house, say a, a two by four, and we can uh, process those and, and glue them up as a, a tabletop or something like that. So you can really maximize the value add. And, and that's where on building and true deconstruction um, becomes much more interesting and much more lucrative when you can really add those values and upcycle materials into the supply chain. There's a lot of talk here in the UK at the moment about um, what they're referring to as embodied carbon. Uh, in other words, the carbon that's been spent in actually, in many cases, creating a material. But I, I guess in in the, the in terms of lumber, it, it's actually the harvesting of that lumber. There is there is a, a carbon footprint that that that's that's been created. How yeah. do you balance that with with unbuilding? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and, and I'm familiar with this because of my green building days. So if we look at, if you look at embodied carbon in buildings, now the, how much embodied carbon is in say concrete and steel versus wood is debated basically by the two separate industries. Um, and me coming more from the wood side of it um, as a residential builder, um, from, from my knowledge, um, wood construction is, a, is about half the amount of embodied carbon as concrete and steel. Um, now, when you look at reclaimed wood, it has 12 times less embodied carbon than than virgin lumber. So reclaimed wood, if you can process that and, and put it back in and build with it, is actually the greenest building block available. Um, so you can't get any more sustainable. And that's because that embodied carbon of the lumber 
has already has already been spent on the original building and then a hundred years later we're coming in and taking it down and, and the energy and resources for us to recover that lumber process it back to the supply chain is is much much smaller than the initial harvesting of that timber your unbuilding process do do you primarily work in uh, residential so houses and, and that kind of thing or do you trip over into um commercial buildings as well no, we we do we do commercial and residential. Um, I, I'd say our bread and butter has been residential in Vancouver because of the bylaws here, the the policy to mandate green demolition. Um, but we have been doing commercial buildings for a few years now, and uh, and sort of always have a commercial job on the go as well. And it's you know we're we're realistic. We work with the owners because some of our buildings are. Um, you know, they're concrete and steel and there's not a lot of lumber and we still want to be able to be that provider for our clients so that if they have a, a nice old wood building, we can deconstruct it in its fullest. If they have a concrete building that's newer, um, it's probably going to be more of a selective deconstruction where we decide what parts we're going to separate and the rest will still have more of a traditional demolition um, lens on it always maximizing the recycling in, in those cases so that we still are separating materials and, and trying to minimize the waste. That's always going to be the case. Um, but yeah, we, we do a wide, wide range of, of buildings and, uh, and really the, the older the building and the more lumber, the better, but we're, we're not closed off to, to just about any, any sort of building removal. I understand the, the desire to uh, recycle and reclaim these, these valuable materials. But I've, I've got two questions, basically. That Does that not make the deconstruction or the unbuilding slow and labour intensive? And then the follow on from that, there, there was a study done here in the UK not so long ago um, that suggested that the, the demand for recycling and, and seg uh, material segregation had actually put men back into you know, hands-on handling of materials. And they'd seen a spike, not major injuries, but, you know, dust in their eyes and cuts and grazes. So hmm. are you seeing that as well? Um, I mean, I would say on building is certainly dangerous, just like demolition is. Um, I, I know that I've been in the wood shop for a few days this week, and I definitely have a lot of splinters in my hands, but that just comes part and parcel with the material. Um, so... I mean, it's it's not something that kind of scares us away from it, but uh, I mean, certainly the industry in general, demo, deconstruction, unbuilding, it's a dangerous industry. We've had, um, unfortunately, there's been some accidents in, in the industry um, locally here in the last uh, few months and just reminds us all that we got to be really, uh, really aware and ca cautious of what we're doing and, and make sure that we're operating safely as a team. Which kind of begs the question, Demolition in its truest sense is, is very much embraced um, mechanical, so, you know, excavators and that kind of thing, or rob robotic demolition excavators and that kind of thing. Is yours more of a hands-on process? Uh, it is more hands-on. We also embrace the heavy machinery as well. Um, and that's part of your, the first part of your prior question, which I didn't answer, is about the timeline. Um, so... Traditionally, we were doing residential entirely by hand. Um, now, depending on the project, we still do a lot of it by hand, mostly because our crew is actually very fast now, um, especially at houses. But we've also utilized a crane to separate bigger houses into pieces and bring it back to our yard and then dismantle the parts on the ground. That gets us off site significantly faster, but it comes with an added cost. Um, and then some, some residential jobs we also pull apart with the, the excavator. So we bring it early because we're always going to have the excavator in there to clean up the, the scraps and take out the foundation and prepare for the new build. But we're bringing that excavator in a day or two early and actually use, utilizing it to pull the building apart as well, the main floor walls and, and uh, floor. And then on a commercial, commercial setting, uh, it's definitely utilizing heavy machinery. Um, so we did a, a distillery maybe four or five months ago, and we cut the entire building up. It was from 1929, um, which for for BC is old. I know that's nothing for, for the UK and Europe, but uh, we, we cut the building up into big panels, like eight by 20 panels, and then crane lifted them out of there. And uh, we just did it one floor at a time. We do a floor and then spend a couple of days bracing the next floor and then the next one. And so it was really controlled separation. Um, but inevitably, we do take more time than demolition. And so that's something we're trying to work with authorities on who are looking at policy around this because we don't think that 
owners should be penalized for choosing to deconstruct. We would like to see the uh, the permits, the building permits released early if they choose to deconstruct versus demolition so that uh, there's actually no delay in their project in the end. They, if anything, they actually gain some time, which incentivizes people to do this. You, know, you just mentioned the word incentive. What, what, what is the market for the salvaged materials? And how does that work? Do you take the materials that you salvage back to a yard and, and then sell them on? How, how does that part of the system work? Yeah, I'd, I'd separate the salvage into a few categories. You've got your, you know, your traditional architectural salvage, which I know UK is probably the leader in the world at this, which is your really fine details of buildings, your corbels and tin roofs and, and different things like that. Um, those are the high end goods. I think the market is pretty healthy for that, um, especially because we don't have a ton of it considering the age of this region in general. Um, Vancouver is only established in 1886, so we're, we're not even 150 years old. Um, and then you've got your reclaimed wood, and that's a very healthy market here in, uh, in North America. And uh, reclaimed wood is typically more expensive than new lumber because it's from old growth. It's bigger, bigger timber typically. Um, and because it's old growth, it's just a better wood. And then the, the amount of uh, effort to get it back to the supply chain requires it to be more expensive um, through the process. And then you've got your low end salvage goods, your, your kitchen cabinets and appliances that aren't the, the, you know, the high, high end stuff. And that's the stuff we donate to our charitable partners. Um, and it, it sells, it sells cheap and the market is, you know, I'd, I'd say it's a, it's a medium sized market, um, as deconstruction inevitably grows, uh, which it will, in, at least in Canada and the U S um, I, I, I am quite certain that in 10 years, deconstruction will be the, the industry standard across both countries uh, and likely other parts of the world. Um, you're going to see a massive influx in materials to salvage. And that's where it's going to get interesting to see how, how those materials, uh, what markets they end up in, because I, I think that we could really be shipping those to other parts of the world that are maybe developing nations that these building materials to your average Canadian might not have much value, but if we ship those to, to, more impoverished areas, they, they'd, be, they'd be quite valuable. One of the issues we have here in the UK is there's been a, a real move in the last 20, 25 years to the use of materials that are difficult, if not impossible, to salvage or or um, recycle or, or reclaim, you know, where you've got uh, composite materials and that kind of thing. So, you know, when you look at our older, you know, Victorian age buildings, you could salvage or reuse just about every part of it. We've yeah. now got buildings that are 20, 25 years old where you're really going to struggle to get any real value out of that when, when it, it reaches the end of its, its working life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same here. We, I kind of say it's like the dark ages of, of building deconstruction from sort of 1990 to today because of how much composite is involved, also how, many, um, how much adhesive and, and screws are involved. It makes it a lot harder to take the buildings apart. You basically can't salvage at least the, the, the bones of the building. Um, now, that being said, we, we're working with a lot of builders, developers, and architects, and we've already had the, the feedback, especially from a few architects that we're quite close with, that them working with on builders has actually started to change the way they're designing their new buildings. And, uh, and this is something that, again, is, is bigger in Europe. I think Europe is about 10 to 15 years ahead in construction technology, typically, than North America, which is sort of where... Um, we tend to look to see what's trending in Europe because it'll come this way in the next decade. Um, and you're starting to see it's called design for disassembly. So the deconstruction process, the unbuilding process is actually starting to now influence those designers and architects who are designing new buildings and think, getting them to think about what happens at the end of the lifespan of this building or this room or this material if, uh, if it needs to get changed out and that's really exciting for us that we can start to actually influence that other side of the industry. Absolutely. Now, if, if the, the name Unbuilders and the process of unbuilding wasn't unique enough, uh, when, we were, when I was preparing for this chat, I did a bit of research. And there's a couple of other things that probably mark Unbuilders as unique. I'll get to the high profile one in just a second. But your email signature carries a statement uh, that your company operates on traditional ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples. Now, as a Brit, I've never come across a statement quite like that. 
what does that connection with your country's past mean to you? And and I've already sensed that that influences the way that Unbuilders operates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is uh, really this year more than any year in the past. Um, this is really coming to light in Canada. Um, it's it, it, this country has a very dark history, and a, a lot of Canadians have been unaware of it or um, purposely negligent. Um, but since the the colonial times, the the, the founding of Canada, um, which was from primarily um, Brit British uh, soldiers and, and um, settlers, there has been essentially a, a controlled genocide of the Canadian indigenous people and their culture. And, um, and it's, it's really tragic. It's really, I mean, quite disgusting um, when you really dig into the, the roots of it. And so for us um, in our service, we're, we're starting to work with local First Nations, which is really important for, for myself and everyone in, in our organization. Um, but there's something quite poetic and beautiful in what we do in the sense we're, we're deconstructing, colo deconstructing colonial era buildings, recovering this old growth, ancient lumber. And for us, we really want to start working with the First Nations to get this lumber back into their hands for, for projects where they're, built, where they're building um, in their territories. And so there's, there's sort of a reckoning happening in Canada um, really over the last you know, five or six years, but um, it's a long time overdue, which is reconciliation. And both the government and the, you know, society, the Canadian society trying to figure out what's the best course forward to make sure that the Indigenous people who occupied, who, who occupied these lands, worked and lived on these lands before this country was even a country, what's the best pathway forward so we can live in harmony together uh, on this land? And so, it's very important to us and it's it's very important to Canadians right now in particular. That's a fascinating story and, and one that I've, I've certainly never come across. Um, I mentioned the fact that there are two things that mark you as unique. The other one, um, this isn't your first time in front of a camera. Uh, you were on the Canadian Dragon's Den. Uh, I, I've tried and I can't access it from here in the UK. I guess there must be some sort of uh, transatlantic copyright issue. So yeah. how did you get on? Uh, yeah, so that was uh, last season. Um, I filmed in August 2020, so in the start of the pandemic. Um, uh, we, uh, I did really well. Uh, that's probably why we post about it and have it in our email signature. But uh, we, yeah, it was, it was really good. There were six dragons on the show, uh, so six investors, and uh, they all saw the value in our company and the movement that we're leading. And we got an offer from all six of them. So it's called the Dragon Sweep. So we, we made a deal on the show for uh, uh, 500,000 or actually 600,000 for all the dragons to come in and uh, for, for uh, equity stake in, in our company. And uh, we have since closed that investment round um, uh, four or five months ago. And a few of the dragons did uh, close with us. So we do have a few of them that ended up investing in our company. That's fantastic. I, certainly watching the UK version, I, I, I'm always left to wonder just how involved the Dragons are once the show is over and done with. But you, you've got a couple that are, are still very much part of the team, I take it. Yeah, they've invested. We haven't really taken that next step to say, OK, it's time to you know get, get you out to our yard and let's do some Instagram videos and, and whatnot and really start pumping the brand. That, that'll happen um, over the next year. But uh, nonetheless, they've invested and, and uh, we've got them as, uh, you know, investors and, and advisors if, if need be. So we're really fortunate. We're really uh, grateful for that and excited to be working with, uh, with our investors. One of the things that strikes me, and it's, it's literally struck me while I've been talking to you, is the fact that you, you've seen... You, you, you've obviously a very entrepreneurial. We're very in touch with your your country and your the, the land that, that you live in. But it also strikes me that you've got what what could easily be a franchise. You yeah. you you could literally franchise unbuilders in different cities, different countries around the world. Is is that something that you've you've considered in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that we're sort of weighing um, over the next six months. Just how how we expand. We've, we've expanded regionally. So we operate in greater Vancouver and now we also operate in greater Victoria, which is on Vancouver Island. Um, so we're in two cities in British Columbia right now and doing some other projects in, uh, in a few other outlying cities, a few hours away. Um, but that's certainly what, uh, what we're looking at is how do we, 
how do we branch on builders into a new territory? And it's likely going to be through franchising um, and uh, and then having our kind of our main corporate uh, operation in some of the larger city centers where we want to really be more involved. Um, but we have a lot of in inquiries, especially since Dragon's Den for franchising into new cities. And, and that's what we're looking to do. Fantastic. I I'm really appreciate your time today, Adam. It's, it's an absolutely fascinating story. And I, I came at it from the uh, the deconstruction, the unbuilding process, but it's the other bits of the story, you know, like you, you said about sort of First Nation and, and you know, the, the, the old growth trees and, and that kind of thing. It really does give you a, an absolutely unique story, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it's something that, uh, as you said, the, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial nature of, of me and, uh, and and the business is is something really important. And um, you know, I was, I was brought up, I was raised by my parents, uh, you know, a quote in my household is some people see things as they are and ask why I dream of things that never were and ask why not. And that's really what has been bred into me. And that's how we, we lead th this company is to look at how the industry is operating and figure out how to make it better. And that's, that's what we're doing. And that's what we hope that we can influence other people to do as well. A big part of what I want to do is educate not only locally, but, uh, you know, abroad, we, we really do want to be showing the demolition industry that there's a better way and, and hoping to influence some other demo contractors to start looking at unbuilding and start shifting in that manner. This is a, this is a worldwide trend that we want to be part of. Not uh, We don't want to be the only company doing this. I, I think it's interesting. I mean, your timing, obviously, we, we've got a, a big global climate change uh, conference here in, in Scotland uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but there, there really has been a shift in focus, as I mentioned, sort of embodied carbon and that kind of thing. But I, I've got the impression that although we, we are very good at recycling here in the UK, sort of 95, 98% of, of materials from demolition is being recycled. I wow. get the impression that the, the UK and and possibly um, the United States as well is waiting for somebody to legislate before they go completely green, um, whereas you seem to be going completely green regardless of what legislation says. Yeah, we've chosen the most difficult path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're also the first mover. Yeah, we're looking at it on a bigger lens. There are, you know, there's other deconstruction companies, unbuilding companies, primarily in the U.S. So we're not the only one, um, but we're looking at it on a larger scale and uh, and looking like we've been really trying to streamline our process so that it's repeatable, it's fast, it's efficient, and so that we can look to expand to other markets. So we are certainly not looking to just stay within our region. We want to be spread, you know, across North America and possibly other parts of the world as well. I, I guess part of that is going to hinge upon. I mean, you, you said that your your local government there has has got um, systems in place to encourage salvage and that kind of thing. I, I, I guess in order for you to to franchise and to expand, that would need to be reflected elsewhere, won't it? Yeah, and it already is. There's several cities in the U.S. that have already um, put in uh, policy to mandate deconstruction. So Vancouver here was, I think, the first, but now there's the city of Portland. San Antonio, Pittsburgh, um, San Mateo County and San Francisco. These places all have policy in place and more coming. So that's what I'm saying. The writing's on the wall. Deconstruction, it's much like, you know, in the 60s when everyone used to use lath and plaster and then drywall was invented. Well, the, the lath and plasterers quickly got either transitioned to drywallers or got replaced. And and that's what is going to be the case with demolition. You're going to see this transition happen, whether whether the industry likes it or not. And so we just want to encourage people to, to get on board as early as you can. And, and we uh, we love working with demolition contractors as well and, and collaborating. And um, there, there's a lot of room for collaboration with what we do. I, I, just on that subject, I mean, is that is that something that you do? I mean, you, I, I guess you guys would go in first you would be first on site and then leave them possibly leave a demolition contractor to the heavy lifting at the end. Exactly. Yeah. We, we work heavily with them and we have demolition contractors contact us here where they get, they get the, the rights to a building that falls under that, that policy that has to be salvaged and recycled. And, and they call us and say, Hey, we, we got this job, but we actually can't do it with our crew. Will you come and do this part and we'll come and clean up at the end. That's fantastic. I, I tell you what, I, I, I do think, you know, in a lot of ways, in, in terms of pure recycling, I think the UK does lead the way. But it sounds, not just you, but it sounds like the Canadians have really got their, their heads screwed on in, in terms of, you know, looking after the, the land and, and, and looking after the, you know, the natural resources you've got. Because I, I think for years, we, we certainly haven't. And, and the, the, the frustrating thing here in the UK, we, we are an island. 
uh, we've got finite resources um, and we've we've just squandered them for centuries. Well, I don't want to I don't want to paint Canada too high of a light because we've we have <laughs> done done things pretty irrationally and uh, we've also treated our resources like they're infinite. Now we've been we're very fortunate because we have so much land in Canada and so many resources, but um, that is becoming quite uh, topical as well to say, hey, we've we only have two percent of our old growth forest left. We've cut all the rest and we're still cutting the old growth. So that's, you know, 2000 year old trees, huge trees. Um, there's a there's a huge protest that's been happening for the last six months in uh, not far from Victoria, where we operate, um, which has been massive protests on old growth logging because the, the forestry companies in Canada are still cutting it. So we are definitely not above uh, other countries in that way. And uh, it's it, it's a global phenomenon, this this realization and um, coming to grips with the fact that we are changing the, the climate for the worse right now. And we all collectively need to work together to, to change that. And that's something that's really crucial for, for our service in, in Canada. Construction demolition waste is 40 percent of the total waste stream. So it's the biggest contributor to our landfills. And that's why um, if we want to make an impact on climate change, at least here in Canada, shifting from demolition to deconstruction is one of the quickest, swiftest impacts we can have. And it needs to be somebody of your generation, I think. I think um, I, I won't ask how old you are, um, but you're, you're clearly a young guy. Um, and and I, think that's, I think that's where demolition and construction for many years has gone wrong. I, I think there's been a, a lot of people set in their ways. We've always done it this way. And and we we're not we're not in that world anymore. You know, we we do need to take a new approach, and, and maybe it needs some new people leading the way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's there's some great leaders in in the industry, not only in uh, demolition deconstruction, but on the other side of it. And uh, I find it really, I think it's a very exciting time for the construction industry. Um, the last the last five years here in the Pacific Northwest, but but really the the next ten to twenty years come forward because I think construction has evolved slower than other industries, but that's about to change and it's already it's already changing. We're seeing a lot of great companies on the rise and it's exciting times for the industry. Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I wish you every success with the uh, with the company and uh, keep in touch. keep us posted on on what you're getting up to. Thank and you so I'll much. Be, yeah. and I'll be watching you on, watching you on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, the pleasure's all mine. so thank you very much. Oh, 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 o